You may not believe this, but this is John Masari, composer of Killer Clowns from Outer Space, speaking to you from Hollywood, California, all the way out to the Netherlands. You're watching Slasher Pepper. So listen to this podcast, learn something, take some notes, make sure you send them to me on my social media. Thank you, and we love you. Hey guys, Slasher Pepper, and welcome to another video. Today is another interview, this time with John Masari, media composer, and uh, we mostly know him for the Killer Clowns from Outer Space soundtrack. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. It's great to uh, be here in, uh, in Amsterdam. Are you in Amsterdam? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a little bit more south near oh, yeah. uh, the Oh, good, good. It's, one, it's one of my uh, goals in life is to come visit that beautiful part of the world. We'll try to meet up then. Yes. Do a face-to-face interview. <laughs> yes, yes, that would be a good thing to do. Oh, yeah. Um, so do you have any new projects coming up? Well, I just finished a, uh, a collection of Christmas music uh, for extreme music. And uh, I produce a lot of music that gets used in trailers and... Um, Te- commercials and television shows and uh, it, it, they show up in movies and video games and it's a wonderful company they have an amazing collection of composers that work there it's a uh, Hans Zimmer is one of the principals wow. so when you work for extreme you bring your a game you know they don't you just don't like well let me just do a groove and some loops and see what they think no 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 you have to bring something that uh uh, bring something to the table that no one has and it was awesome working with um, uh, Russell Emmanuel who is the uh, CEO and he's kind of like the he calls himself the evil genius of the company and he kind of you know when he sees when you got something going he he makes suggestions you know like a uh, like a good director music director would do or, or a conductor, you know, he'll say, you know, you should explore this area, explore that area a bit more. What you got here is really good. And then there are some times where he goes, oh, I'm not feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you just, you, you roll with the punches. So I, I, I've, I was been working on that for a few months. Um, there are uh, other things I'm working on. They're developing. Uh, there's a wonderful project that's coming out. I can't, I can't even mention a word about it. I'm anticipating that it's going to be March or April. So, uh, and definitely since you're a fan of, uh, certain genres of film, uh, you'll, you'll definitely get wind of it. There'll be enough, uh, of a, an announcement that you'll get it. And, and I've been asked to do the teaser for it, which is really awesome. You know, when they do the uh, social media teaser on it, right? really excited about that. Well, sounds promising. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. And, um, to go back to way start of your career and uh, mm-hmm. and basically life, uh, who mm-hmm. or what got you into music? Well, I think it was uh, a combination of the who and what. Uh, all the great people of the world that create wonderful music that w- was on this little magical box called a ra- AM radio when I was a kid. <laughs> and uh, ever since I could remember, I was always tinkering with anything that made sound, especially a or radio, and um, sometimes when I wanted to listen to a record, even if it was three o'clock in the morning, as a little kid, I would go and uh, back when I was a kid, the sound system for a house was like a piece of furniture, and you would lift the lid, and there would be a turntable, and there'd be a, a FM radio, and it was uh, it was called the hi-fi system, a hi-fi right. uh, a sound reproducing system. They had, you know, you had AM radio, FM radio, and it even had shortwave. You can you can get the shortwave and listen to people that are broadcasting on shortwave. Um, I don't think they have that feature uh, now. We just have uh, YouTube. But I used to, <laughs> I used to, I used to just pick out any record and play it at three o'clock in the morning. And my parents were like absolutely terrified that the ghost was playing music. And I thought, it, I thought it was turning it low enough. So. Uh, it started in an early age and I used to make, uh, I love the guitar. I used to see, watch, um, we used to see, we used to go to performances of, of country music where I lived and I saw Chet Atkins, 
Dolly Parton, uh, all kinds of, they would perform at this little amusement park called Knott's Berry Farm. And one thing about country musicians is they're very accomplished musicians. And so you would be up close see, watching these people play. And it, to me, it was like, it was just so, it was like magic. You know, uh, if, if you ever played any sports, <clears throat> of any sports and then you go see a professional team play like you're right on the field or right on the court and watch them play it's uh, it, it's an amazing incredible experience so that affected me quite a bit and um at some point when i was six years old my mother learned wanted to learn the piano uh, she it, it really wasn't for her and i started tinkering with the piano and it, we'd go see movies and i found out when i would see movies what affected me the most was the music. And so it wasn't until I was around 11 where I figured out, oh, this is what I want to do. You know, I didn't even know what it was called. I thought, I thought composers were called music writers. I, I had no idea. <laughs> so I had to learn as I went. And my parents had no idea. My parents were not in the media industry. They didn't have a really, outside of appreciating music and liking to listen to music, there, there really wasn't any musical, um, capabilities in my family so now i'm here today talking yeah. to you <laughs> <laughs> that's where it started that that was the the germ right yeah right and um uh what was your favorite killer clowns from outer space scene oh are we talking about killer clowns from outer space how how who would have how, thought uh, how appropriate <laughs> um Okay, my favorite scene from Killer Clowns from Outer Space is when the farmer first walks up to the spaceship here. And it's, oh, yeah. so, and it's so mysterious and magical and uh, it kind of draws you in. It's, there's such a, um, a, a sensual curiosity you have for this. What is a circus tent doing in the middle of a forest? <laughs> and you find out that it's not a circus tent. <laughs> It's full of aliens who happen to look like clowns, you know, and I just fell in love with, I just fell in love with that scene and uh, anything to do with that scene. It was just uh, fascinating to me. Do you think uh, your music also plays part into that scene being your favorite? Well, I, I would, I, I would hope so. Uh, because I remember the one piece of music I played from Killer Clowns from Outer Space is that first scene. I played it to my grandmother at the time. She was alive at the time. I used to play her things all the time. I used to come over with a boom box and put a cassette in um, and I would play it for her. And, uh, you know, previous to, previous to that, like a few months earlier, I had done the wonderful world of Disney theme. And she was, oh my goodness, she was so proud of that. So she heard this scene and she said, oh my goodness, it's so beautiful. It's mysterious and beautiful. What is it for? I go, well, grandma, it's for a movie called Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Goes, <laughs> Terrible. Can they change the name? Is it too late? <laughs> so uh, that, yeah. So when I saw that, I, I sensed, uh, there was a, a sense of magic and mystery and and some and a little bit of innocence too, because you have the the um, you don't want to make it look menacing when the farmer approaches this apparition, or if you if you whatever for lack of terms, you don't want to give away the fact that he's going to kill. It's you want to play up on his curiosity, his fascination, of his wonderment. So there's this like little bit magical kind of. Uh, 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 <clears throat> atmosphere created to bring you in right yeah at, th at that point you could still see you know maybe it is going to be lovely clowns from outer space but we all know how that turned out <laughs> or maybe gorgeous women and circus performer women will come out or something you know we don't know we don't know it's just a fat clown that wants to bag the dog and kill the guy and put yep. him in a uh, put him in a cotton candy uh, cocoon Right. <laughs> That's the, the whole thing about it. it comedy and uh, in film music is timing. Um, there, I, I have, I'm very outspoken in the fact that I very much admire the music of um, Elmer Bernstein. 
especially his work in comedies. And uh, two comedies in particular, uh, Stripes and uh, the both uh, the Ghostbuster movies. I have taken a cassette deck into the theater to just record the sound, to study how the music times out and what makes it funny. Part of it's like plays up against the scene. You know, so when you have a legitimate sounding piece of music playing against something that's absurd, it's funnier than if you played absurd music. Right. See what I mean? And and even within that legitimate music, you you have times places where the music times out, such that there could be stops and starts. I mean, the music is very uh, busy, and then times where the music is very sparse. You know, so that comes from you learn that from listening over and over, and then practicing. And I had done. Before Killer Clowns, I had done a num number of projects that by the time I came to Killer Clowns from Outer Space, I had logged in enough flight time, so to speak, that uh, I could have fun with it too. And that's right. what we, any endeavor that you have, you want it to be uh, artistically satisfying for yourself as well as the people that will enjoy it. And Killer Clowns was one of those experiences where it, it did not feel like a job. It felt like a joy. And working with uh, very creative uh, filmmakers like the Kyoto Brothers was made that process execute so much more effectively. Awesome. Sounds like you had a blast um, mm -hmm. doing the soundtrack. Well, I, did, I did have a blast. Um, the first day of recording was uh, Halloween. The first, day, <laughs> first day I went into the recording studio was Halloween. I was soothing yeah and um of course well obviously just from this interview alone um you're most well known for killer clowns from outer space but are there any other projects that you are like really proud of and feel like deserve more credit honestly more credit i don't know if i would say more credit um i i can only go by this what i um uh, if i if someone says what are you going to listen to that's going to entertain you about your own music. Cause I'd rather listen to some other ones, some, uh, someone else's music rather than mine uh, because I'm already familiar with mine. <laughs> but if I had to listen to uh, a few there, there was, gosh, I would have to go through my IMDb. There are a few movies. It, it, it's not just the movie. It's the circumstances in which the, the movie was, uh, the, the, the score was composed like the people that I worked with, you know, maybe it not, might not be as popular, but um, it, it's that experience of, of the camaraderie of working with other people that make, uh, uh, make projects uh, very interesting. Um, I did, um, uh, for instance, I did the, the cell, the movie, the cell, there was a sequel and I did the sequel. It, you know, it, it, it streams, it still plays. Um, and it's a, a a big grand horror score, like an operatic level of uh, of a horror score. But what was fun about it is that the producers they worked at Universal Studios here, and they wanted to have me instead of me coming to my place or me going over there or emailing um, quick times of the music. They wanted to be able to have lunch with me every other day and come visit and listen. And so um, I just basically transposed my uh, working environment to Universal Studios. So I was there for like two, two months and it was a lot of fun. I, uh, I got to create a lot of great music and I got to work with, work with and meet a lot of new people. So I would say The Cell 2 was, is a favorite experience that you can compare that to um, Killer Clowns from Outer Space. There's also another horror film called Ring Around the Rosie. And I'm <laughs> laughing because I, one of my best friends is a sound designer and he's worked on everything from, he's worked on Academy Award winning pictures, right? Just, just giant pictures. He's everything that Clint Eastwood did. Uh, he did, I think, all of the Mummy movies, you know, did the sound design and sound effects for all of them. And I uh, introduced him to my filmmakers and I told him, please 
whatever you do, don't take this job. Just tell them what they need. So he took the job, even if though, even though they weren't paying a high scale. And it was a lot of fun to work with my friend because we were, we kind of grew up together. And uh, so that was a, a movie called Ring Around the Rosie. It was a psychological horror thriller. So they're not really popular, <laughs> but the experience, see, I'm laughing now yeah. because I, I could do a whole hour on all the crazy things that happened at that movie that were, to me, were hilarious. So there you go. That's a, that's a bit of insight. I'm kind of revealing um, a very personal aspect about my career. So uh, th that would be it. Uh, and every, all the stuff I did for Disney was a lot of fun. You know, um, uh, all the things I did for, um, there was a time I, I did a lot of uh, commercial work. I did a lot, I was in the advertising business for quite a while. I think about eight years, a, a friend of mine who's a uh, musician who's played with David Bowie and Michael Jackson, he had a um, music production uh, facility that they did strictly commercials. And so I did that for a while and that was a lot of fun. It was very exciting, very intense energy for a short burst of time. So I hope, I hope that's, information that's useful it, to you definitely yeah so <laughs> yeah it's not I, it's not as sexy as you probably want but you know it's, <laughs> no, but it's, I the can, real, it's the real thing yeah i can totally see though especially with um with like things you create yourself that mm -hmm. it's more about the pro uh, the process instead of like the the final product almost yeah right uh, okay, here's another one. I, I, this, this was a lot of fun. And this, you can relate to this. Uh, Bear All McCreary right. did a horror movie with the same people that, that do Death Day. You know, Happy Death Day. Oh, I'm right. familiar with that series. Okay. Yeah. So he called me. He says, John, you know what? The film directors keep bringing up your name. And would you like to take part in this? And so we worked together on that movie. It was about a, an amusement park where a serial killer, it was an amusement park, a horror themed amusement park where a serial killer was going around killing people. So we had a lot of fun doing that. I did like about six or seven cuts to that. Yeah, I saw that you did that. It was for Hellfest, right? That's the movie, Hellfest, yes. Yeah, yeah I saw you did the, um, because there were multiple composers for that one, if I'm correct. Right, right. And yeah. of course you did the one with the clown. Uh, Scene. <laughs> yeah and, and a bunch of other stuff too there was yeah. other there were other they basically says you know pick something that you go through the movie and here's the scenes we need music pick the ones that's your favorite and there was one that people were kind of like avoiding and uh that's the one i did and it was a lot of fun it's where tony todd comes and kind of introduces the uh, uh the festivities tony todd as you know is the uh candy man uh, he, right. He was the main character in Candyman. So, um, so I I did that scene. That was a lot of fun because I would be talking with uh, Bear every once in a while, and he and he would say, "Hey, did you ever think of doing this?" I go, "That sounds like a good idea." <laughs> or he'd say, "Wow, I never thought you could do that." Whatever. It was just you know the interaction was a lot of fun. I can imagine. And um, <laughs> what are some of your personal favorite horror movies? My personal favorite horror movies, that's a very good question. Um, I just saw one last night that I really liked. It was called uh, The Devil in His Time, directed by Antonio Campos. Beautiful, it was made for Netflix. What's, what's scarier, uh, uh, it, to me, it's almost like a horror film because it's real life can be, real life horror can be more, um, the, more disastrous than watching a movie like The Nun because you know sure that's not real yeah this was like real and horrific so uh that's my latest one that I really like uh the other uh movie that I liked to me is like uh like a grand opus would be The Shining classic um, so so for me my taste is more like The Shining than um than uh let's say friday the 13th for instance although it's friday the 13th is fun and it's a, and it's a great business model for making film as you know the cast keeps getting smaller and smaller as the movie progresses which means you have less people to play to pay yep <laughs> there's less there's less things to shoot as you move on so it's okay you're spending less money and spending more money toward the end of the movie 
and uh, it's always fun to see the last two. Uh, and I've done a few of those with uh, a very famous horror director. Uh, he's done like hundreds and hundreds of movies. His name is David Dakota, and he's a consummate producer and filmmaker. And I've done I've done what he considers are like two or three of his favorite films. Um, and they all have different titles. Each one of them has different titles for different reasons, but there's a movie he did called Final Stab. That was basically modeled off that thing. You have a bunch of kids at a location, uh, good they looking kids, <laughs> and they all get killed off and there's like two at the end. Um, and then we still kind of don't know who the real killer is, uh, sort of thing. So, um, but anyways, so back to the favorite thing, I would say The Shining is one of them. Um, I love uh, Insidious. Uh, just about anything that Christopher Young has done the score to. Uh, and by the way, he and I went to school together. He went one year after me. And, um, uh, you know, I just love it. As a matter of fact, I, I, I went to a screening of to the two Hellraisers that he did a couple of years ago. And it was really fun to watch the two Hellraisers years after. Because I remember seeing it when it first came out in the movie theater. And now I see it again. And when you see something with di a different perspective, it, you have a different experience. So oh, yeah. I think that would be it. Something that's like, like grand opera to me. Grand opera horror is, uh, is very exciting. Yeah, because all of those movies that you just uh, mentioned have great soundtracks too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Joseph Bashara, he's, he's, uh, he, he's just like, He's just excellent with creating fear. Oh, yeah. And um, what are some of your own favorite musicians? Now, that could either be like a band or like uh, movie music, uh, anything. Why do you ask me such tough questions? <laughs> you're so, you're so, you're, you're instigating trouble here. Um, yeah. Because I'm going to leave someone out. My goodness. Uh, what are some of my favorite bands? I think before we started this, I told you that uh, years ago yep. I heard a band called Middle Class Rut and I just love yeah. their music. It was just so defined. They have just like, you listen to the music and it's like such perfectly defined ideas and they all work together wonderfully. And uh, my daughters, when, they, when I first got it, says, dad, why do you like this? I go, it's like angry boy music. <laughs> <laughs> I, is that a thing angry boy music i don't know i just liked it there was such there's a little enough rage and, and angst in it that I, I could appreciate and identify with what they're you know the lyrics and the music you know um and it's not a relative it's not a huge band it's not hugely famous um i like uh, uh k-pop music i don't like to write it but i like listening to it it puts me in the mood um, I like, um, lately, this is very obscure. No, there's K-pop, which comes from South Korea, right? Yeah. I've been getting into pop music of North Korea, the state sponsored popular music where they put on these gala events and like three or four girls in like, kind of like very attractive military like uniforms sing and dance and they have all the girls and most of the most of the orchestra are attractive women playing and it just fascinates me <laughs> because the music is so well performed and practiced and rehearsed the arrangements are are, are very very um uh you know they're uh i'm not gonna what's where i'm looking at well crafted okay arrangements and i have no idea what they're talking about <laughs> see i just am fascinated with it so my taste in music is kind of crazy frank zappa has been a big influence on my life um i was probably three years old when i saw him appear on a local variety show it was called the steve allen show and i later saw it on vhs um where he was a guest on this variety show and he, he brought out like a bicycle with a, a violin bow and he was making music with the bicycle, you know, blowing into it <laughs> and talking about a giant orchestral piece he was working on. And he was probably 19 years old at the time, a young kid. And uh, it's interesting to see a young Frank Zappa 
who was kind of shy and giggly and but yet very committed to his art and um so frank zappa uh, I, I very much appreciated his music um as far as bands my goodness gosh they're all uh, there's all kinds of bands that i really like can, 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 is it okay if i just don't outside of the one i just get, uh, talked about middle class right is it okay I don't talk, I mean, you name a band, you name all the great bands from the 70s and 80s. I like, I loved Van Halen when, when the Beastie Boys came out. I couldn't get enough of them. They were just so, I go, this is so bizarre. I would have never imagined. Like, when I listened to the Beastie Boys, the very first few albums of theirs, and I had somewhere, they're probably really big collectors, I have some of their 45 singles. Somewhere. I bet, I bet you don't have their 45 singles. <laughs> Um, so I would listen to that and I'm going, who would have, I would have never thought of this, <laughs> you know? And that's what fascinates me about listening to other people's music that, um, you know, that they come up with something. And I try, I, I try to steer directors away from using tent music. And I says, come on, we're just going to perpetuate us. It's all become going to become homogenized. Nothing's going to sound different. You know, we, we got to try to do something, you know, what are the movies that you appreciate? Well, that movie that you like, there had never been a score like that. And it was unique to that film. And so we can come up with something that you can call your own. And best compliment I ever got from a director is after he listened to a piece of music, he had this look in his face. It was very, a dull blank stare. And I says, is everything okay? And he goes, I'm hiding back a tear. <laughs> you know, keeping from crying because he, he he liked whatever he did he, he liked it a lot or another guy said that is so weird and that's a big that's a big compliment to it me. is <laughs> yeah it's a huge compliment so it's it's better than if you would go that is so normal <laughs> you guessed it you guessed it so yeah that's uh that's interesting to hear for sure um probably after the interview you'll be like uh Shit, I should have named that band. <laughs> right, right. Afterwards, I'll be, you know, but like, like I said, I, I, I like Van Halen. Um, uh, obviously, Metallica, you know, early Metallica and recent Metallica. It's, you know, they've gone through a lot and they're still making great music. Um, I mean, when I grew up, I grew up playing uh, the Rolling Stones um ozzy osbourne when he was called uh black sabbath you know <laughs> i mean if you you know it's interesting there, there was a swedish band called hocus pocus no excuse me I'm... a swedish band called focus oh, i don't their, know i haven't heard their, of those their big hit was hocus pocus and uh it's interesting i was fascinated when i listened to those bands and i think about a year ago i listened to some remastered and remaster it's not like they did anything different they just okay you're now you're going to hear the music you grew up without the re without the scratches and record pops from a record and um i was just amazed how well conceived like um black sabbath songs are musically um from a musical standpoint and musician standpoint and the way it's sonically presented and mixed you know um i get to appreciate it even more so that, that, I guess that's why it's called classic rock or whatever. Um, and so um, that's, you know, anything that was significant that was out, uh, I, I appreciated. In classical music, uh, lately I've been uh, rediscovering uh, Bruckner. I, I don't know how I went all these years without really closely looking at Bruckner, but now that I'm kind of, kind of more locked in than usual, um, I hope I don't bore you to death, but uh, <laughs> I, what I would do is like listen, familiarize myself with a Bruckner symphony by listening to it with the ears, right? Uh, most people I know study classical music, they pop open a score and they read the score while they're listening to the music. And to me, that's like, no, no, no. The music happens up here. It happens up here. It happens right. down here. Right. So I would listen to it for maybe a couple of weeks. Then I found a YouTube channel that has the actual handwritten manuscripts of classical music. And they flip page by page. They'll play a recording, flip page by page. And I think I gained millions more brain cells. 
I learned much more. I things all of a sudden started to make sense and have a flow. Now, okay, I heard I, I got the emotional impact. I got to hear the music. Now I get to see the blueprint. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. it means so much more. I, I remember when I studied music, they said, okay, open up uh, to this symphony or that string quartet. We're gonna study it. And I never heard of it before. And we're talking about the chord in the first measure. And it has no has no bearing on what's going on you know you have to listen to it over and over again where like you can kind of play it in your mind without listening to the recording then when you look at the score everything all of a sudden boom the world opens up to you and you can take that whatever you get from it, it like builds more creative muscles in your brain and you could uh, approach music your own music in a, in a more effective way yeah i definitely feel like um you can listen to music and then do do something else in the meantime. Right. But you can also listen to music, you know, right. You're just really focusing on every single uh, note, basically, you know? Absolutely. And th so this is the way I listen to, uh, this is the way I listen to most of my music when I'm creating it and checking tracks and mixing. Yeah. Like that. Because, if you're looking at the plugins, the timeline, the DAW and everything like that, you're so distracted. But when you shut your eyes out and just listen to music, you can pick something out. That's, that's not right. That's too early, too late, or that's not the right sound. It's, it's sticking out. It's affecting me. When you can sit there with your own music and experience it without like picking it apart or like waiting for the next beat to come, that's when you've hit it, hit, hit it on the mark. Yeah, that's also um, with like album covers, I feel. Um, mm. If you see an album cover and then you listen right. to it, you right. already sort of have this have it visualized in your head, you know? Okay. Even though if you just listen to music like this, like you're visualizing your own thing, you know? Right, right. So that's why all album covers should be black. <laughs> well, but then you're visualizing black. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, what's, yeah, your, no. what's your biggest instrument? What's your instrument? I I don't play any instruments. You don't play any instruments. Okay. I I would like to, you know, maybe make music later, but mostly I'm focused on directing. But who knows? Maybe I'll be like John Carpenter and do both things at the same time. You know? Who knows? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just play five notes over and over again, and and right. <laughs> basically, you'll be happy with it. You know? Exactly. <laughs> um, and here are some more. Um, you know random questions um okay. what do you think hell looks like the real hell yeah uh, if, if the real is... hell will be completely alone without the people that you love that's it <laughs> that's just it's the, no one i don't think everyone's anyone ever asked me that question the real hell like after you die and you go to hell you're there without uh, alone with no no one that uh, with nobody that you love is going to be there would suck to end up there <laughs> and that's it yeah sure <laughs> okay <laughs> and um <laughs> if you could get rid of one thing in the world what would it be assumptions <laughs> where people assume something of you because sometimes when people assume they assume the worst before they assume the oh, best yeah. i'm kind of romantic and i get <laughs> suckered into things because <laughs> i assume the best of people and it's like no 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 you're completely wrong so i would say if i get rid of one thing in the world this is assumptions let um let someone uh present themselves to you and uh let let, discover things as they truly are not what you th would like them to be in other sh in other words shoehorning in uh your uh, perspective on something let let the let <clears throat> let's say if we're talking about people let them be who they are yeah and be able to accept them for they who they are i, I mean assumptions kind of come like automatically, but I always try to like stop myself from having like strong assumptions because right, a lot of times they're wrong. Yeah, 
like like people people assume that I'm a big fan of horror. Oh, I like horror. It's not all it's not all of what I'm about. I mean, I like metal. I don't only listen to metal. I love classical music. There's not only one particular type of classical music I listen to. Um, and that goes for for anything else. And people make assumptions. Oh, that, that's benign though. But I th believe you, I think you understand what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. Getting rid of, of assumptions and uh, judgmental and 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 um, you know, always assuming, you know, people sometimes, sometimes people assume the worst before they can ever get to know someone, which is really sad. So that's what I would want to eliminate in the world. I think if um, assumptions will be gone, like a lot more opportunities will be able to, to happen, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then a final question, um, mm -hmm. this is going back to, you know, who would have thought killer clowns from outer space? <laughs> oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> Do you think we'll ever get a second killer clowns from outer space movie? Well, that's a very good question. And I have an answer for you. Um, killer clowns from outer space is owned by a international uh, publicly traded company. And the company is MGM. And they have a website and they have a contact on the website they even have an address and you can drop them a card and say, we would like to get another killer clown movie because we love it so much. And if you want to add, if you could bring back the original uh, filmmakers, especially, <laughs> jo especially John, Masari, <laughs> that would be wonderful. And you just say that like 10 words, you know, you send it a, car, a postcard. You know, can you imagine MGM if over a period of say, a year or two they get 300 postcards saying we like it. people expressing themselves in their own way about they would definitely be but but for i for reasons that i'm unaware of they have not pursued that route that that may change next week as far as i know but that would be lovely wouldn't it yeah yeah especially if they would bring back john masari because he was oh, such a yes, great yes musician on the first one <laughs> i would i would be i would be so i'd be so thrilled it would be like uh christmas every day oh yeah <laughs> going back to that world would be awesome to kind of revisit yes. that oh yeah absolutely is there anything you would like to add to the interview uh no other than it's been really nice and uh i can't wait to come out to uh the netherlands in person um one of my favorite orchestras is the Concertgebouw Orchestra of Amsterdam, and I would like to see them perform live. Hopefully, I'll come there during concert season. <laughs> yeah, and I, well, I don't care what they play; I'm going to get a, a good seat and enjoy it. So, on row, <laughs> absolutely, and enjoy some great uh, uh, Dutch food. Oh yeah, Dutch food is awesome. <laughs> yes. Maybe that's a little arrogant, but um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, <laughs> I, I would love to have that. There's uh, a few places out here that are that, that have well, they mix them up, they they you know, Swedish and uh, uh right. you know, f from Scandinavian countries, right? Uh, I guess they call them, I'm not 100% sure, but they kind of mix them up. Um, but I would like to have the the real thing that would be just wonderful, and the people, and you've got some incredible musicians. Yeah, there for sure. That would be definitely definitely, and and probably catch a metal concert or something like that. There was a um, metal band, and their name escapes my uh, memory. I participated in their Indiegogo campaign because all they all they needed was ten thousand dollars to buy their album back from the record company, and they wanted to do their own do their mix their way and uh they end up raising i, I forget a lot of money like a, a very large amount of money and so and they financed they financed a tour this is like two years ago so they toured through all of europe uh with the money from uh supporters so they not only got to mix the new album it financed um a, a concert tour so i thought that was really great so i'm going to look them up and try to see them in person wow that's awesome <laughs> yeah i saw um slip not live beginning of mm -hmm. this year and that was just intense with like the the crowd going crazy <laughs> right that had yeah live concerts are awesome I, and i 
uh, I'll confess, I've seen some really great bands live in concert like Led Zeppelin. And I've seen Kiss. Remember the band Kiss? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I saw Kiss live, uh, Van Halen live, and um, uh, uh, Black Sabbath or Ozzy Osbourne live, and uh, a bunch of other. Oh, yes, um, Pink Floyd. Oh, it's really awesome. And the uh, Elton John, and I don't know if he could, I don't know if that's a big deal for me. He's a really good musician, performer, and also, uh, oh, our favorite, uh, Rolling Stones. Of course, classic. You know? yeah and it's like man uh boy those were those are great those were great experiences yeah the concerts you know i miss them now you know yeah with the, the whole pandemic going on can't yeah. wait uh so we can uh can go back to uh concerts again well i uh, i will confess that i was in uh, the very beginning stages of getting a the second Killer Clown concert going, and uh, we had to put it off. Uh, we just had to like sh turn the brakes off because it was getting, it was really great what we were doing. It was very uh, a very very uh, clear and exciting strategy that we had, and uh, I hope to uh, reinitiate that in the summer. Hopefully, yeah. You well, you reinitiate the plan. The concert is going to have to come. Yeah. Maybe 2000, maybe 2022. You Who know, knows? Because, Hopefully, yeah, so, though. So I have to keep very, like, I have all my uh, vitamins and work out and make sure I'm in great shape to do a tour. Well, you, you probably have uh, more time now than ever. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I guess uh, that about sums up the interview. Yeah. That does. Well, this is, Roger, this has been a really great interview. It's really, I'm really uh, happy to uh, be your guest. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more of your work as well. I really appreciate that. And uh, of course, same goes to you. Okay. Well, well uh, that was the interview with John Masari, um, multiple media composer and um, mostly known for Killer Clowns from Outer Space. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. See ya. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Pisses me off, Roger. You may not believe this, but this is John Masari, composer of Killer Clowns from Outer Space, speaking to you from Hollywood, California all the way out to the Netherlands, you're watching Slasher Pepper. So listen to this podcast, learn something, take some notes, make sure you send them to me on my social media. Thank you, and we love you.